as soon as you get the kinds of projects. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today at College of the Sequoias. I'm Dr. Jennifer Vega Lacerna, and I'm the Vice President of Academic Services here at College of the Sequoias. And I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are here in person, separated by chairs and wearing your masks properly, I appreciate that. And those of you, I think we have well over 50 people on um, Zoom. So we appreciate all of you as well for joining us. So I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Randy Villegas, our wonderful faculty member, for putting this event together and to our committee that helped put this speaker series together. But most importantly, I want to welcome Dolores Huerta to College of the Sequoias. We are so honored. Thank you. This is a huge honor. We are honored to have you here. We welcome you. We embrace you with open arms. We have a small gift for you. Um, you can open it later. I'll put it here. Thank you. But uh, we have a COS, a College of Sequoias t shirt, a College of Sequoias pen, and a College of Sequoias face mask for you to wear for the future. So, welcome. Thank you for being here. We are honored. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Vice President. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful welcome. And uh, before we begin, and as folks find their seats, I want to take a moment to talk about our series and share Dolores' biography for those of you who may not be as familiar. I also want to remind you, um, for those of you online, we're going to be sharing a link to a Google form where you can sign in for all of you in person. You might have noticed as you walked in, there are some QR codes. Please, uh, at the end of today's event, please take a quick moment, scan it with your phone, and fill out that Google form so that way we can keep you informed about future events and we can take care of our attendance, right, for uh, grant purposes. So our civic engagement series, which kicked off this month, or last month actually, seeks to connect our student body here at COS, our campus community, and the public at large to critical conversations around politics, political science, local and statewide government, advocacy, political participation, and of course, civic engagement. We are so excited to have Dolores here today, and we want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the American Political Science Association Centennial Center for Research for funding a grant to make this series possible, the Political Science Department here at COS, our Social Science Division, COS Administration, and our wonderful IT team for helping with the logistics and for helping make this event happen. So please, let's give everyone a round of applause. Now, Dolores is the founder and the president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation and the co-founder of the United Farm Workers of America with Cesar Chavez. She's a civil rights activist and community organizer. She has worked for labor rights and social justice for over 50 years. In 1962, she and Cesar founded the United Farm Workers Union and she served as vice president and played a crucial role in many of the union's accomplishments for four decades. In 2002, she received the Puffin Nation $100,000 prize for creative citizenship, which she then used to establish the Dolores Huerta Foundation, also known as DHF. DHF is connecting groundbreaking community-based organizing to state and national movements to register and educate voters, advocate for education reform, bring about the infrastructure improvements in low-income communities, advocate for greater equality for the LGBTQ community, and create strong leadership development. She has received numerous awards, among them the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award from President Clinton in 1998, and in 2012, President Obama bestowed Dolores with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. Please let's have another round of applause. So I've got a few questions to get us started for tonight. Uh, but really, I want you all as participants here in tonight's event to feel free to ask questions. For those of you in person, uh, after we ask a few questions here, we're going to set up the microphone so you can walk up and ask questions. And for those of you online, please use our Q&A or chat box function if you have any questions uh, that you would like to ask the Lord today. So to kick us off, what inspired you to organize? Was there ever a defining moment that inspired you into activism? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. And can you all understand me okay? Yeah, I did. Anyway, um, I, I think I was always an organizer. Um, 
I had the good fortune to be a Girl Scout. Any Girl Scouts in the house? <laughs> and it's really interesting about, I think about the 40% of the women in the Congress, in the US Congress, were former Girl Scouts, okay? So being a Girl Scout really teaches you a lot about uh, teamwork and also about the environment, you know, which is something that I know, we know is a really popular topic today. Uh, as a youngster, I was always organizing. And uh, uh, as a teenager, I actually organized a, a youth center uh, because uh, many of us didn't really have a place to hang out. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it was closed down uh, because the local police did not want to see uh, uh, kids of color hanging around with white kids, you know? So they closed our teenage center. And uh, then we opened up another one and they closed that one down also. And uh, that one was opened up by a Methodist minister who let us have his church where the kids could hang out and play games and stuff. And uh, I, I spoke to him afterwards and they actually told him that he could not uh, let us hang out at his church. So, they, so I was always uh, trying to bring people together. Uh, as a young adult, I was very active in my church and uh, we had an organization there and uh, then I joined uh, some other groups of, where we would have uh, uh, we would have uh, dances and raise money to give uh, Christmas baskets, you know, and Thanksgiving baskets. But in these organizations, the, there was never any real changes that were being made. So I had the good fortune to meet a man named Fred Roth Sr. Yeah, he was uh, had been a teacher at USC, University of Southern California, and then. Uh, from there, he uh, came to work uh, down there in a place called Weed Patch. Is anybody here from Kern County? <laughs> yeah. So Weed, Weed Patch is a, the, the place where the Grapes of Wrath was filmed. And I think a lot of us know about that film, The Grapes of Wrath. And uh, Mr. Ross uh, there was the camp manager. And if you see that movie, The Grapes of Wrath, Fred Ross Sr. was the camp manager, the kindly camp manager in that movie. Well, he he was uh, he was a, uh, he worked with the Japanese when they put the Japanese into the internment camps, and so he got a reputation. Oh, then he went uh, to work in uh, Los Angeles, uh, where they had the, the school segregated, where they had the Mexican kids in one school and the Anglo kids in another school. And needless to say, the school where they had the Mexican kids was very inferior to the one where they had the white kids. So. Mr. Ross organized the parents uh, to desegregate the schools. And there's a film that has been made. Maybe some of you have seen that. It's called Mendes versus Westminster. Well, Mr. Ross is the one that organized the parents to desegregate, to, to desegregate that school. So in Los Angeles, there had been a, a lot of uh, violence. Uh, many of the young uh, sailors were going into the uh, Mexican neighborhoods and beating up the Mexican kids because they used to wear zoot suits. You know, they call them pachucos. Some of you will remember that. And uh, so the Los Angeles City Council uh, called a, a guy named Saul Alinsky from Chicago, who had done some work in organizing in the neighborhoods of color in Chicago, and said, "What?" And they, so they called Saul in and they talked to him and they said, we want to do something about the Mexican problem. Now it was the Mexican kids that were getting beaten up, right? But they were the problem. So Saul told them, well, what you have to do is help them get organized. Well, that's the last thing they wanted to hear. You know, <laughs> they, they didn't want the Mexicans to organize. So, uh, so Saul uh, stayed in Los Angeles and he raised some money from the Jewish community. And they hired, uh, this, they hired Fred Ross to go into East LA and to, help organize the Latino community there. And so he did, he went in there and they, they got the first uh, Mexican American <clears throat> elected to the city council of Los Angeles, Ed Roy Ball. This is way back in the late forties. He then went on to, to become the first Latino congressman uh, to, the, to the US Congress. So Fred stayed around. He went to the whole state of California uh, organizing these uh, chapters, the organization was called Community Service Organization, CSO. 
So he went to San Jose and that's where he found Sasa Chavez and he organized Sasa. I was living in Stockton and Fred came to Stockton. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to this meeting with one of my college professors and uh, there was just the three of us in that meeting and Mr. Ross started telling us these stories about how they organized the people in East Los Angeles, how they brought in clinics and they brought in sidewalks and they brought in street lights. And then the one thing that really hooked me is how they sent police to prison for beating up Mexican American youth. And I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. If you can send a policeman to prison for beating up young people because they happen to be Mexican, Mexican Americans, I want to join that organization. Because as I said before, where I grew up in Stockton, it's a we were my 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 neighborhood was very diverse, uh, eth ethnically diverse. So in our my my group back in the, back in the day, you could say the word gang and it was okay. <laughs> so you know we had my neighbors were, were African American, my friends were Filipino. We had some. Uh, Asian, Chinese, and Japanese, and of course, Mexican Americans and the white kids, you know. But we were always getting harassed by the police because we were all, all of this diverse group was hanging out together. So I thought, and then I knew some of my friends that had gotten beaten up by police, including my brother. <clears throat> so when I thought you can send somebody to prison for beating up a young person of color, I want to join that organization, and I did. And so that is where I first met Sasa Chavez, and that's how I got into organizing. That was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a, a perfect answer. Thank you so much. Um, so you joined the unions effort, you joined the CSO. Mm -hmm. um, when you joined, how did you become empowered, and what sort of obstacles or challenges did you encounter based upon your gender and being a woman in that sort of space? Well, the one beautiful thing about Mr. Fred Ross is that uh, he was not a chauvinist and he really believed in women uh, taking leadership. And so in the community service organization and throughout the chapters, we had chapters starting all the way from Los Angeles up to this, the Bay Area and also the coast and the valley. And so we had a lot of women presidents in that organization. <clears throat> so so that, that was not an issue. But out of that organization, because Cesar Chavez had been a farm worker and he always had this desire to organize farm workers. So uh, after working with CSO and I was a political director of the community service organization and we, we passed a lot of great laws uh, that, are, that are still very effective today. In CSO, we passed a law that you could vote in the Spanish language. We passed a law that you could get your driver's licenses in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And a really, really important law that we passed that if you were a legal immigrant to the United States, if you had your green card, that you could get public assistance. Because there were many of the of the many of the members of CSO who were not citizens, and they were legal immigrants. Their children had gone to war. You know, many of them, their kids had gone up to the service but they couldn't get an old age pension. And so uh, we were able to pass that law. And I wanna tell you the story because one of the senators, he was from Merced, Senator Colby, he was the head of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, social welfare, I guess you call it a, a committee in the legislature. And so we had to get his vote. So what I did is I had the parents these, elder, these elders go with the pictures of their children that had served in the military, okay? And so I took them to Senator Colby's office and I parked them there and I left. So I said, when the Senator comes out, tell him he, we need to get his vote on this bill. And even if you don't speak, speak English and he doesn't speak Spanish, just stay there and hold the pictures of your children up there so he can see, okay? And so we, we did get his vote. But of course, we also had to send a send him a, a many many letters. We probably got over a thousand letters from people in the community, but we finally got his vote. But so we did a lot of great things in CSO, and 
So not only did we get a age for old, old age pensions, age of the blind, age of the disabled, but later on age of needy children for people that are legal immigrants to the United States. And today that law is a, a national law all over the United States. I started to say Seth Chavez always had this burning desire that he wanted to organize farm workers. So, uh, so we, we got together and we made a we made a plan how to organize farm workers, and we thought that the CSO was going to support us uh, on 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 our plan, but at the convention uh, that we had, then they turned us down. They voted it down. So Sasa left the CSO. I left CSO. Mr. Ross also left CSO, and we started the Farm Workers Union. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to establish the Dolores Huerta Foundation and dedicate your efforts right here in the Central Valley? You are a nationally world-renowned icon, right? Why did you decide that it was important to do work right here at home? Well, when we look at the Central Valley, and this is such a special place, there are only, I think, four or five regions on the planet, like here where there is the climate that you can grow so much food. So when we think of this place of where we're, we're sitting right now, what a special place it is. And it has been a special place for many people, but for the people that produce the food, as you know, you know, they are still in poverty. They are still very discriminated against. And somehow all, all of the good that has come out of the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley as a whole in the other state of California, it has never really come down to help the people that produce the food, you know? And of course, that is why, why, why we came here to work and we're still here because we know that it can be changed. But the one thing that we learned in organizing that Fred Ross taught us, that the only people that can change their situation are the people that are being affected that you cannot wait for somebody to come in uh, and, and change it for you. And so that is the kind of organizing that Fred taught us to do, that you have to organize the people and they have to stand up for themselves. They have to learn how to defend themselves and, and how to do the, the uh, political work that needs to be done to change laws. And of course, that's what happened with the United Farm Workers. Uh, before we had the strike in 1965, we organized for three years. We had house meetings in people's homes to let to, so that they could overcome the fear uh, from, of, the, of organizing, and, you know, to, so they could come up with the courage to go on strike and, and uh, do the boycotts and everything that it took uh, for us to win. But they had to understand that nobody could do it for them. And, and I think that was the great lesson that they learned. And we're still here trying to make that difference and trying to, in the organizing that we do with the Dolores with the Foundation, um, we organize people, we have to remind them that they actually have power. Um, many of them, maybe they never had a chance to go to high school. They never had a chance to go to college, but that does not lessen the power that they have. But the power that they have can only be uh, demonstrated or utilized is when they come together with other people. In other words, you can't do it by yourself. I like to say even Jesus needed the disciples to help him, right? <laughs> and so once people understand that, they learn that lesson that they have to work together and do a direct nonviolent action, that this is the way that you can make the changes and get involved in the, in the democratic process. So I call organizing, it's something like democracy 101. You, when you have a democracy, and that is what we have in our United States, at least this is our, 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 our dream that we have a democracy, it can't work if people do not engage. I liken it to a, a, if you have a, 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 a football game, one of the teams shows up and the other one doesn't, the team that shows up is going to win. So we've got to let people know you are part of the team. This country is yours. 
but you've got to go out there and you've got to you've got to take your civic responsibility seriously and get engaged. A lot of people don't know that or they don't feel like like civic engagement is for them. They think, oh, this is for other people to do. We have to make them understand, no, this is about you too. You have a civic responsibility to also get engaged. You pay taxes, you need to be able to go out there and work for somebody to represent you that is going to have your values and will give you, give you the resources that you need. And so it, it's, uh, as we all know, that California, we are what the fifth largest economy, and yet we have the highest rates of poverty. And where are the highest rates of poverty? Right here where we're sitting, right here in the Central Valley. Thank you for that thorough response. Uh, with that said, what are some of the efforts that your foundation is currently working on? And before I get, before you answer, I just wanna take a moment to personally thank you for your work on education. Uh, I graduated from a high school in Bakersfield, California in 2012. At that time, our high school and our district had four times the state average and seven times the national suspension and expulsion rate across the nation. And it was Dolores, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, Melda, and other organizations that brought them to court and essentially challenged them for disproportionately suspending and expelling young men of color. I remember having classmates being kicked out of a classroom for chewing gum, not spitting out, for quote, talking back and being expelled, right? For one incident, right? For wearing a hat and not turning it to the front or taking it off. These are the kinds of issues that I saw growing up. And so I wanna thank you for fighting for that change and ask you what are some of the efforts that the foundation is currently working on today? Thank you. Well, the lawsuit that we filed against the Kern High School District, uh, they suspended 2,300 students in one year, 2,300 students in one year. The majority of the, the vast majority of those students were black and brown students. And uh, it was actually the California Rural Legal Assistance mm -hmm. and then Maldif, Maldif and other groups came into the lawsuit, but initially it was the CRLA uh, that did the work to file the lawsuit. And the way we were able to find out what was happening is by having house meetings with a lot of the people uh, that went to the to Bakersfield High School, people from Arvin and Lamont and places like that, and of course East Bakersfield, and uh, and we did win that lawsuit. By the way, we just settled that lawsuit about a month ago, because they're pretty recent, and uh, and and we still have a long ways to go. Uh, the teachers at the current high school district, about eighty percent of the teachers are Anglo's. Uh, the other, like the less than 18% are of color. So you have a lot of implicit bias that is there at the very, very beginning, but they do have to change their practices and uh, they're still working on it, but they're still under the jurisdiction of the judge to make sure that it happens. Uh, they have to have a black history month, which they never had before. Uh, they have to have an Hispanic, Hispanic heritage month also. And now, as you may all know, that the state has passed a law that they have to have ethnic studies now in all the high schools, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be mandatory. So that I think will be helpful to start breaking down uh, some of the biases and prejudices that the teachers have against kids of color. So, but right now we're actually, actually active in 17, di 17 different school districts uh, in the Kern County area covering 350 schools. And the way that we organize is we organize the parents and we organize the students and then they bring recommendations because under the California law, state law, all of the school districts, including here, well, it's throughout the state, actually here in Tulare County also, they get the, the funding directly from the state. But as part of them, as, as part of all the schools getting the money directly from the state, uh, they have to uh, give a certain percentage of money, uh, has to go for a, a low income children, uh, uh, first uh, language learners and also foster children. And as part of them getting the money also, uh, they have to accept recommendations from the community, from the parents and from the students. So in all, all of our uh, schools that we are active, we have these committees, as I said, of parents and students, and they can give rec recommendations uh, directly to, uh, to the school districts. Over 40% of the recommendations 
that we have made have been accepted by the different school districts. So our, we are covering 350 schools in 17 different school districts. And all of this is being done by our organizers and by the parents and the students of the, of the different schools. And I'll give you some examples of some, some of the changes, some of the dramatic changes. In one of the schools, uh, they had a, a, the gentleman that was in charge of the curriculum for the teachers did not have a credential. So they got rid of him, okay? <laughs> we, there was another school uh, where they wanted to get rid of the uh, breakfast program for the farm worker kids. Can you imagine getting rid of the, uh, so the, 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 the principal didn't want to, he wanted to discontinue uh, the, the breakfast program. So they got rid of the principal and they kept the breakfast program. <laughs> <laughs> There was another another school district, uh, another school where the uh, uh, this was a school district actually where the the superintendent was actually uh, taking some of the money uh, that was supposed to be going to the kids and he was using it for his own for his for his own purposes. So they got rid of him also. So uh, and of course a lot of this too is getting getting uh, the people that we work with uh, to get them to uh, be able to sit on the school board themselves. And in fact, right here in uh, Woodlake, uh, one of our, one of our, we call them vecinos. Well, in the uh, foundation, when we organize people, we call them united neighbors. In Spanish, that's vecinos unidos, okay? So one of our vecinos is now on the school board here in Woodlake. And he started out, him and his wife, because they wanted to, uh, they wanted to, uh, to have a neighborhood park. And they found this land that uh, the city, they were paying taxes on the land but it wasn't being used for anything. So they were able to get the city to build a neighborhood park in their neighborhood. And from there he got involved and now he sits on the school board there in Woodlake, okay? And so part of the work that we do is to encourage our people uh, to serve on the school board and to serve on the water board, uh, recreation board and city council. And so, I mean, so that they could take the, take the power, right? It's about them taking the power. And uh, one final question before we go to questions from our audience. Mm -hmm. Throughout your lifetime, you've led efforts that have truly transformed issues in agriculture, labor, education, and so many other issues. And so I want to ask you, do you have a favorite moment working on any of these campaigns that brought you immense joy, that it's just a very happy memory, or that you're most proud of? Well, there's so many things to be proud of. I mean, uh, with United Farm Workers, we know that farm workers who work under and have worked under a, a contract uh, with the union that they had the health plan and their pension plan. So when they finish working, that they get a check every single month. Isn't that amazing? And they have a death benefit, not only for themselves, but for their family members. And so uh, it's really important to get that word out to farm workers to know that they're covered. But unfortunately, uh, it's only in California that the United Farm, excuse me, no, let me correct that. In the California and in Washington state, the farm workers really have a union contract. And here in California, farm workers have unemployment insurance, uh, disability insurance, but only California and Hawaii are the only two states that I believe have that coverage and, and the right to join the union. New York state, uh, just before the pandemic in 2019, they passed a farm worker bill of rights. But farm workers in all of the other states of our country do not have the rights that we want here for farm workers. And by the way, I want to just, uh, we have somebody in, in the audience that I just want to point out to everybody. Uh, as you all know, we had a march all the way from Delano to Sacramento. In fact, we had several marches, but the first march that we had uh, uh, was uh, led by a, a, one of our <coughs> original members of the Farm Workers Union. And uh, he was the captain of the march. And he's here with us tonight, Robert Busso. You want to stand up for a minute, Robert? <laughs> and that, if you, uh, by the way, I don't know if you've seen the documentary, Dolores. There is a documentary, Dolores, and you can get it on Amazon. And uh, you'll see pictures of that march, and you'll see pictures of Robert. And also, when Robert Kennedy was with us in Delano, um, uh, Robert was one of the people that was able to, uh, to staff Robert Kennedy. And it was really interesting because uh, the, the local police department 
they thought that they could stop the march. <laughs> so they, they sent the police officers, and you know, there's a march for getting ready to march. And Senator Kennedy was still in town because he, we had had, he had we had had a hearing the day before the march. And uh, anyway, uh, as uh, they're ready to start the march, all of the police they 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 formed the line in front of the marches. And Robert was with, Robert was with Senator Kennedy, and Senator Senator Kennedy he called the chief of police <laughs> and told him, "What did he tell him, Robert?" <laughs> so anyways, so Robert, uh, Senator Kennedy was able to uh, get the police to let the march go forward. So anyways, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, we're going to start off with a question from our live audience. So do we have any in our Q&A? Mm -hmm. Not quite yet. Okay, we have three. This one's the most updated. Okay, so Danielle Alberti asks, Dolores, what is your opinion of the work that is being done to help farm workers that have been disproportionately affected by COVID? Um, well, and you, you did ask me the question a moment ago about what the foundation is doing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, unfortunately, as you know, all know, there's a lot of ignorance around uh, that is being perpetuated and trying to get people to keep from getting vaccinated. Uh, and uh, we have to you know, continue to tell people that it's important that they get vaccinated, that they shouldn't have to wait till somebody dies in their family uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, but the, the, our foundation, we have been doing vaccination clinics every single week, every single weekend we have vaccination clinics. We have had canvassers, as many as 90 canvassers going door to door, getting people to sign up for the vaccination shot. We have done phone banking, and when people go door to door, they instruct them, but they also they get them to sign up. And we have been moving the vaccination clinics around uh, to different neighborhoods uh, so that the, to make it more accessible. So we have literally, uh, we have literally had a, a, a few thousand people vaccinated, but we know that we still have uh, a long way to go that there, because a lot of people get these messages. That, in fact, I just heard this one of a woman who got COVID and she's out of the hospital, but she almost died because they told her that she didn't have to get a vaccine, that the sun would protect her. And you know, we have other people that have been told that if you're religious, you don't have to worry because God will protect you, right? And uh, I think God protects you if you get vaccinated. <laughs> so, you know, just getting all that information out there to people. We've also done a lot of work on social media. And in, in the foundation, we have a, a strong youth organization. And uh, our youth organization is also, you know, putting out social media to kids to get them to get their parents vaccinated and, get, and for them to get themselves vaccinated. I should explain that the Dolores Huerta Foundation, we are actually working in four different counties. We're working in Kern, Fresno, and Tulare County, and also up there in the high desert, in the Antelope Valley, and in California City. And we got involved in California City uh, because there's a, a, a large a population of African Americans up there. Mm -hmm. And in the schools there in California City, eight out of 10 of the Black children were being expelled and suspended. Eight out of 10. Can you imagine that? So we have made some progress there. Uh, there's now a new superintendent of schools. Uh, we were able to get them to form an African American advisory committee. So it's all about you know organizing the people and then getting them to take on the issues in their in, in their organization. We've also been doing a lot of food banks. Mm -hmm. We have uh, been doing food banks uh, almost every single weekend in the different areas. And one weekend we had ten food banks at the same time with over three hundred volunteers to make that happen. So uh, thank you and everybody uh, from the Dolores Huerta Foundation staff for making that happen. Um, I want to move on to questions from our audience. I'm going to put up the microphone right here. So if you would like to ask a question, feel free to. Um, I'll, I'll hold it for you. If you'd like. Thank you so much for coming here. Gracias. My question to you is, what recommendation do you have for Spanish serving institutions like a COS to retain more minority faculty? 
because we really don't have too many minority factors here at COS. And I see the disparity between us who are minority faculty, how we treat our students, and the faculty who are not minority and how they treat the students. So what recommendation can you bring to this college and all the colleges here in California so we can increase more minority presence in the colleges? Because when you are Hispanic, no matter what part, you are North Central or South American from Venezuela. So I can identify with my students much better than another person would. But what can you recommend to the colleges and universities to increase the minority population of faculty, not just in the school K through 12, but also colleges, especially the one who are Hispanic serving institution? Thank you. Thank you for you that want, question. Do you want to summarize that? Yeah, for our folks online as well. Uh, the question is, what can colleges, K through 12 institutions, educational institutions here in the Central Valley that serve minorities, what strategies and what can they do to help retain faculty members of color that also represent the diverse populations that they serve? I hope I got that more or less right. Well, I, th I think that uh, education has got to be the savior of our country. And uh, teachers need to be paid more money to begin with, and they need to have the kind of support system that they need uh, everywhere so the teachers will stay here. And, uh, and, it's, and when we think of our Latino population that is growing, only 2% of the whole population of teachers in the United States are bilingual, only 2%. And when you think about that, you, we see where the need is at. So we've got to spend a lot more money on education. When we look at the uh, at the budget of the Pentagon in the United States, you know what we're what we're spending for defense, you know, and and we compare that with the amount of money that we spend on education, it is shameful. In California, the budget for prison is higher than the budget for high school education. Can you imagine that? And when we think about, you know, Jesse Jackson, the civil rights leader, he says it costs more money to send, to keep somebody in jail than to send them to Yale, you know, the university, right? You know, you think about that and how much money we are taxpayer dollars that are going into prisons instead of going to education. And right here in, in, the, in the San Joaquin Valley, starting from Bakersfield to Sacramento, you know how many prisons we have built? 22. How many universities? One, University of Merced. So when we look at that, then we got we see that there's something wrong with the system that we are actually making money off of prisoners, right? And it's taxpayer dollars that are that are supporting all of the prison system. And and who are the people that are going into prison? Again, it's black and it's brown and poor white kids that don't have and families that don't don't have the money to defend themselves. So that, that whole system has got to be changed. And so when we talk about criminal justice, you know, and if we put enough money into education, then kids are not gonna get in trouble in the first place. I mean, I was a school teacher and as a school teacher, and I know the school teachers in the audience, you know, when you have a child in your class that needs attention, that something is, that something is wrong with that child and to get them the kind of support and help that they need so that they don't end up in prison in the first place. And so uh, th this is, of course, some of the things that we have to work on. The other thing, the other statistic that is so scary, the United States of America has more people in prison than India or China. I mean, India or China, their populations are billions of people, billions of people. We only have about 300 million in the United States how can it be that we have more people in prison than those countries that have billions of people in population? And the other thing too, and I'm just gonna talk for a minute, divert a little bit to the whole issue of gun violence. I think we all learned today that there was another school shooting in Michigan, that students were killed by another student and the whole idea of people having guns. And you know, also today, I think you all saw the word, that the Senate was having, and not the Senate, the Supreme Court was having the hearings on Roe versus Wade, you know, on women's right to abortion. 
And so these these people that are against women's right to choose, um, against women's reproductive rights, they're all for guns. Okay, we have we have more people getting killed in the United States from guns than any other country in the world. And these are the same people that are saying that they're they're going to court and saying that you can't mandate masks and that you can't mandate vaccines, and yet they say they're pro-life. Okay, you know. They're not pro-life, they're pro-death. And they're trying to use all of these issues to keep women from having the rights that they need to have. I kind of went on a tangent on that one. <laughs> and one staggering statistic I share with all of my classes is we talk about education and prison spending, at least here in the state of California, we rank 39th or 41st in the nation, depending on how you measure spending, in terms of per pupil expenditure. That's how much we spend on each student in the classroom. We are number one out of all 50 states in terms of per prisoner expenditures. All right, so something to think about. We're gonna move on to a question from our online audience. So we have a question from Eric Armstrong. Ms. Huerta, you've been a living legend for our students. So from your perspective, what work remains for the future, particularly for higher education? And then sort of related to that, is what would you say to young people who say politics isn't for me or politics doesn't affect me or my vote doesn't matter? Well, I, I think they're combined when we talk about education and we talk about politics. I mean, one of the reasons that we have a divided nation right now is because a lot of those people that have so much hatred against people of color, they don't know the real history of the United States of America. You know, I like to tell people Google a map of the United States before 1848. When you, when you see the map of the United States before 1848, what do you see? A third of the United States was Mexico. One third of the United States was Mexico. So when they say to you know, us Mexican Americans, go back where you came from, hey, we were here before the United States was the United States. So who are the true immigrants that came to the United States? The Europeans, including one of my great grandmothers, by the way, you know, who came from Spain. But, but you know, so all of this hatred against the indigenous people, the people of the North American continent, the South American continent, these are the true Americans. These are the true Americans. And so this hatred that they have against people of color comes from ignorance. So we have to change that. And we have to start teaching children uh, in, in, I know now we have it in high school, I think studies, but we have to start in elementary school to start teaching, number one, where did our human race originate? In Africa. The human race came from Africa, homo sapiens. We were all homo sapiens. And our human race then traveled across the planet. Some of us went to the the northern, the northern part of the, of, the, of the planet in Europe and people lost their color, right? They got lighter in skin and, and uh, now you have to go to the tanning salon to get your color back, you know, <laughs> or the beach, you know? But, but the, the, we are, if, if we do our DNA, it's somewhere in there, you're gonna find a little teeny sliver of African in your DNA, because that's where we all came from. So. We are really all Africans of different shades and colors. So we can say to the KKK, the Proud Boys, you know, the neo-Nazis, get over it, you're Africans, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I would say to you right now, look at the person next to you and say, hello, relative. <laughs> Yeah, because we are all related. We are all related. We are one human race, homo sapiens. And if we can start to, and little children, they are not prejudiced. They learn that from their parents. They learn that from their parents or from the culture that they grow up in. So we can start teaching little children from the time that they're in kindergarten, you know, talk about where one human race, talk about where human civilization began. And that way they will know their origin to begin with. And they will never grow up with the idea of hating another person because of the color of their skin. You know, so that, that is so crazy. So we have to start doing that. And we also have to start teaching gender studies. 
So little boys will also learn that they have to respect little girls, that little girls are human beings, they're not sex objects. You know, because when we talk about people getting killed every day, a woman is getting raped or beaten or killed because some man or somebody thought she was a sex object, you know? I mean, we have just, I think this week, I don't know how many in Kern County, a bunch of teenage girls are, have disappeared. They can't find them. The, the Native American women, and I guess you've all heard this too, that if you have a woman of color that disappears, uh, that nobody really does anything to try to find her. But if it's, a, if, it was, if it's an Anglo person that disappears, then okay, if it's an all out effort to find that person. So we've got to get rid of this racism. Martin Luther King said, racism is a sickness. It's a sickness that we have in our society and we've got to heal. We've got to heal our society and education is the best way to be able to, be able to do that. And education, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said uh, during World War II, they were trying to take money out of the education budget to pay for the war and the libraries. And he said, we will not take one dime out of our education budget or the libraries because education is the soul of our nation, okay? It's the soul of our nation. So, and so when we, you know, during slavery times where they would not let the, the slaves, it was, it was against the law for them how to read and write. So we had something similar going on right now. When we look, especially here in the Central Valley and in many parts of the South, and by the way, this is all over the United States, not just here, where kids of color are not given an equitable education. You know, this is purposeful. This is to keep them from gaining power or even gaining their own place in society. So this is something that has to be remedied. And we have to really think of putting that on the front of our agenda. As you said, we're number 39 now, 39 or 41, depending yeah. on how you measure Well, and before that, we were next to Mississippi. But, you know, we passed uh, the Dolores Huerta Foundation. We belong to a group called We Are California. And we did two campaigns. Some of you will remember, we passed Proposition 30 and Proposition 55. We were able to bring in $12 billion into our educational system. In the last election, and I'm sure some of you will remember Proposition 15. Proposition 15, would have brought in an additional $12 billion into our educational system, okay? But it lost by just a few points during the election. And, and we have people like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, give me a break here. They were opposed to our proposition, mm -hmm. you know? And even so many of our local leaders, political leaders here in the Valley were opposed to that. And we lost it by just a few thousand votes. We almost made that. And that would have brought us maybe from 39, I thought we were 36, at least brought us up to 20. When I, was, when I went to school many years ago, elementary school, we were number one in California. We were number one, I mean, in, in the United States, we were number one in education of the amount of money that went uh, to, uh, to a went for each student. I got my violin classes in elementary school I got my dancing classes in elementary school. Other friends of mine got their art classes in elementary school. And we were provided the violins to play, you know? And we had the teachers that taught us how to dance. We don't have that in our schools anymore and our kids need it. So we have to really, really fight hard to make sure that we can improve our educational system if we're going to get out of this dilemma that we are in right now, when we have all of this ignorance and division in our country, and it does come from a lack of education. Thank you. Well, I want to pass it on. Anyone else in our audience have a question for Ms. Huerta? I want to prioritize any students first who might have a question, just because I know, no offense to anybody, but are there any students who have a question? Are you up there? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. Sure, I'll uh, come up to you real quick, just to say hi. And for microphone purposes. Sure, you will. Hi, my name is Jocelyn. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is so I'm not very like, cold, like cold. I'm kind of political and I'm not because I feel like every time that we try to talk about something like education, 
it's kind of like, you know, oh, we don't talk about it, or you know, we don't want to talk with someone about it. And it's hard because I feel like I'm both, like, I'm very neutral. So I want like, your opinion on how you can normalize talking about politics in the classroom, where it doesn't become, like, you know, like a, like very like radical or like, you know, like tension, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I teach poli sci, so I love this question. <laughs> well, that you know, we don't use the word politics, but use the word in civic engagement. You know, we saw a lot of young people and older people too marching uh, around Black Lives Matter. We've seen women marching around the Me Too movement. You know, and. Uh, the one thing that young people have to understand, it's wonderful to march and to protest, but that really doesn't change anything in the long run. Yeah, you bring awareness and you, you know, you, you, people learn about the issue, but unless you put it into a law, it doesn't make any difference, okay? It doesn't, I'll give you an example. You know, the farm workers didn't have toilets in the fields uh, when we started organizing. They didn't have cold drinking water in the fields. So when I signed the first contract, I put into the contracts that the, the employer, the growers had to give the, provide the workers a, a porta potty out there in the fields. But it didn't become a law in the state of California until we were able to get, uh, you know, the Jerry Brown and, and the other legislators to put it into a form of a law. Now there's a law throughout the United States. If farm workers are working in Texas or Georgia, or Illinois, they have to have a porta potty out there for them, one for men and one for women. It had you have to put it into a law. So the changes that we want to, to see made, it's got to be put into a law that can be implemented, it can be enforced, and that people can be held accountable. Okay. So some of the things that students need to fight for, uh, we need to have free college education, free college tuition for all for everybody in the country. They have this in Europe, in Scandinavia, people have free college education. I mean, we know students right now are burdened with college debt, but in those countries, it's free. The places in Latin America, even in Mexico, University of uh, the UNAM in Mexico, you know what the tuition is? It's 25 uh, cents, you know, that's a peseta, you know, uh, in Cuba, Cuba, which is a, country that is under an economic boycott by the United States of America, every person in Cuba has a free college education. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an engineer, free in Cuba. And not only that, but they have free health care. Every, every person in Cuba has a free health care. We are the richest country in the world, the United States of America, the richest country in the world. There is no excuse and no reason why we shouldn't have universal health care and free college education for every single person. But the only way that we're going to get there is that we have to elect people to our Congress to make that happen. And, and, that, and, that, and the only way that we can get people to our Congress is we have to get out there and do the work. We have to register people. We have to inform people. Uh, and then get them to vote. And then some of you have to run for these positions also. So voting is at the basis of our democracy. You could not have a democracy if people do not participate. You know, so it's, it's really crucial and important that everybody that you know, please get them out there, uh, you know, get out there and get them to register to vote. We're gonna have elections coming up next year. And I would just say to everybody, please get out there and uh, help your friends get registered to vote. People in your family, if they're not citizens yet, help them become, to become citizens. This is a way that we make the have. And if we don't do this, democracy is not going to work. We're going to have fascism in our country. We came very close to this under Donald Trump. Everybody saw what happened on January 6th, right? We came very, very close to that. So it, it's gonna be crucial We if we want because they say that democracy in the United States is a dream that it hasn't really, really been totally fulfilled. Well, we are the ones that have to do the work uh, to make that happen. 
as I said before, nobody is going to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves. And here in the Central Valley, we're kind of in a microcosm here because the political, the economic and the politics here are very close but to some of those places in the South, you know, that we, we see what, it, what it's like. What is the economy? It's agriculture, it's oil, it's prison, the prison industry. You know, this is our economy here. And then of course the school districts, like in Bakersfield, Kern, the Kern High School District, I think is the second or third largest employer uh, in, in, in Bakersfield, you know? So the, we have to, we have to re reform uh, these institutions and we have to uh, dismantle the powers of oppression, okay? The systems of oppression, but we're the only ones that can do it. Nobody can do it for us. I hope that answers your question about, about what we call politics. Sorry, Go ahead. Okay? because I deal with this a lot and I've told you in my family. It's been being difficult in having these conversations with a lot of people that are around you, right? Your family, your friends, and how to learn to maneuver those difficult conversations with people. And so uh, well, the, the suggestion is how do we maneuver those conversations? Well, I, I want to give you a hint on the whole issue of abortion. Uh, there was a, a president in Mexico, his name was Benito Juarez. Uh, and in the first indigenous president, president of Mexico after they got the independence from Spain. And he had a great saying, and I wanna share this with you and share this with your friends and relatives who are hung up on the whole issue of abortion or gay rights, okay? Uh, and this was his saying, and I'll say it in Spanish, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, respecting other people's rights is peace. If I, Dolores, decide to have 11 children, which I have, but my daughter Juanita prefers to have dogs and cats. That's her choice, right? <laughs> so I have to respect her choice and I know she respects mine. <laughs> and so again, if, if someone falls in love with somebody of the same sex, lives with them, marries them, that is their choice. It doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect your life. And people should not be persecuted because they're gay, lesbian, you know, bisexual or transgender. You know, we, we have to respect other people. And the people that use the issue of abortion and gay rights, they use that to divide people, you know, to get people to fight amongst each other. So, because what, what are the, the real issues are the economic issues. These are the real issues. The fact that you have 10%, 10% of the wealthy families like Walmart, and the, and the wealthy corporations like Amazon, that they control 90% of the wealth of the United States of America, 90%. That, that's a mind blower when you think about that. 10% of the wealthy families and the wealthy corporations control 90% of the wealth. There's something wrong with that picture. There is something wrong with that picture. When we can't get universal health care, we can't get free college education, that we have people in the United States of America, the richest country in the world, living on the streets that are homeless. There's something wrong with that picture. And the only way that we're gonna fix that is to elect progressive people to the Congress of the United States to change that, to make those wealthy people pay their fair share of taxes, because they're not paying their taxes. That's why we have so much poverty. So. Again, we have to change it. It's in our hands. Si se puede. Thank you. Uh, we are just about at time. I, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you have any final words you would like to share with our audience. I think we have a final if you, question. If you're willing to stick around for a few sure. minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you've been at this your whole life. Uh, you've been at this a very long time. Um, it occurred to me when you mentioned the law that now requires porta potties. It makes me profoundly sad that we have to have a law so that some human beings who hire other human beings for the whole day will provide porta potties. I mean, this is so basic. Um, 
you've, you've experienced a lot of meanness, no doubt, a lot of hatred, a lot of malevolence. How do you keep your morale up? <laughs> Great question to close off on. Uh, 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 thank you for the question. Again, I want to uh, say to everybody, watch the movie. Uh, the, it's a it's a documentary, the, the Dolores. Okay, because in that uh, documentary, you'll see that I get beaten up uh, by the police in San Francisco, and so it's a very dramatic. Uh, and, and it's a documentary, so it's not a narrative, you know. Uh, but how do I keep my uh, morale up? Uh, because I know that there's people out there that will organize that They will come together. They will come together, and they will take that direct action. We've been a little bit stymied by the pandemic in terms of doing our house meeting. Uh, but uh, so, so my, my way of thinking is if I can talk to another group of people and we can hire more organizers and then we can get more people uh, to get involved in the democratic process that I'm talking about. I mean, that is, that is why I, I, keep, uh, I get, uh, get, keep getting inspired that we, we do have to go out there and just tell people, this is your country, you have to fight for it. This is your democracy. And I wanna share another quote with you. And this was a, a Spanish philosopher named Jose Ortega y Gasset. Uh, he was uh, uh, in, in charge of education uh, in Spain uh, before Franco the dictator took over. And he wrote a book called The Revolution of the Masses. And in his book, it's a really short book, it's only 100 pages. He said this, if you do not have an educated citizenry, the greedy, corrupt, and the powerful will govern. And that's kind of where we're at, okay? Under President Trump, that's where we were at. If you do not have an educated citizenry, and we know that we have a lot of ignorant people in our country right now, people that are saying, don't wear a mask, don't get vaccinated, going to court to keep people, you know, from, from staying alive. And that's all comes from sheer ignorance. And the people that are out there saying that the election was stolen, you know, uh, this is sheer ignorance. It's not science. You know, even women's reproductive rights are talking about science, right? So uh, it's, it, this, this is what we have to change in our country. And I'm going to say a few more words too about women, okay? I'm going to quote Coretta Scott King now. I quoted Martin Luther King. Coretta Scott King said this, we will never have, power, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. <laughs> but, but I, I actually changed her statement. I changed her statement to say this. We will never have peace in the world until feminists take power, okay? And there's a difference because not, not all women are feminists and we have a lot of men like the men in this room that are also feminists and they support women, right? <laughs> That's, that's what we have to think about about getting progressive elected, getting feminists elected, and we can do it. It's, it's in our power. And so before we go, and I do want to say something, I want to thank uh, the gentleman here that was uh, 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 guiding me and helping me today, and he's got his badge on over there. And we're not anti-police, I just want you to know that. <laughs> In fact, in my past life, I was a deputy sheriff. <laughs> I worked for the sheriff's office in Stockton, California. I was in charge of all of the files. <laughs> but I had to be deputized and I had to take people to court. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, maybe just to close, I, and I do want to correct uh, one word that people were saying over and over. The word icon. My youngest son, Ricky, says, Mom, you're not an icon, you're an ICANN. <laughs> And then, and then I, I, will leave you, I will leave you with this, okay? I'm going to ask you all a question, and I know, I know you know the answer. And let's all stand up. We've been sitting down so long. Okay. So I want to thank you very much for, for taking your precious time to be here this evening. And the question I'm going to ask you is a really simple one. I'm going to ask you, who's got the power? And I want you to wait, hold on. <laughs> I want to ask you who's got the power. I want you to say, we've got the power, okay? And then when I say, what kind of power? You're going to say people power, okay? So we try it? Okay. Okay, let's go. Who's got the power? We've got the power. What kind of power? People power. Okay, some people aren't sure. 
Okay. Okay. Let's let's try it one more time, but this time let's do it. Let's raise the roof. Let's raise the roof. All right. Let's go. Who's got the power? We have. What kind of power? We have. So are we going to go out there and use our power and get engaged civically? Get out there and do campaigns. <laughs> what do we say? Se puede or no se puede? <laughs> Okay, that means yes, we can. Okay, so let's let's do it with an organized hand clap. Everybody, let's go. See, say, see, Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Please, another round of applause for the Lord's work. And, you know, to close off, you, you quoted a lot of philosophers, a lot of, you know, notable civil rights leaders, but I feel like I have to end this event with one of my favorite quotes from you that I think has just truly transformed the way I think about every moment that I live life. And that quote, by yours truly, every moment is an organizing opportunity, every person, a potential activist, every minute, a chance to change the world. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you for coming. Thank you all of you. Oh, I wanna, yeah, um, I forgot something. Please. I forgot that. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. We have some of our staff here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, Angel, who is our Tulare organizer, along with Luisa Quesada, our other organizer, and Lily Catalan up here in the front row. Want to stand up, Lily, for a minute? <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, we, we talked about Lisa there. We're having a march on redistricting, what I was going to talk about, but got involved with everything else. As you know, uh, right now we're in the middle of drawing the voting lines, uh, the redistricting, and uh, the Board of Supervisors in the Kern and uh, in Fresno County have adopted lines that will make it, uh, not make it easy for people of color to be represented, okay? So we're having a, a march in Fresno on Saturday at 11 o'clock, and we would like to invite you to join us. Uh, now in Tulare County, I think the Board of Supervisors here did a pretty good job, but not in this, the city council, I think is, is not doing its work the way it should. So in Tulare County, you're having problems over here. So if you could come and join us, if we're, if we're gonna have a march and a rally in Fresno at 11 o'clock and the, the leaflets here, they have the time and the place, okay? So please come and join us, okay? Come and join us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as you make your way out the door, you'll see some papers with QR codes on them that say scan me. Please thrust out your phone real quick, scan that. It's just a quick Google form for you to sign in so we can take attendance. And you can tell us about, you know, if you have any feedback or comments about today's event. You'll see them posted right outside these doors, as well as in the front uh, screen sliding doors and in the front. So please take a moment to scan those before you leave uh, and fill out that short Google form. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. Stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you at all events next semester. Hello. Hi. How are you? See you again. Can we get a picture?